This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. It's great to see so many people here. I don't think I've seen it this full uh, for a long time. So thank you all for coming to the last seminar of term. Um, and I'm sure you're all here because of Claire. Uh, Claire Langhammer, um, who is Professor of History and Head of History at the University of Sussex. Um, her book, The English in Love, was published in 2013. And I uh, know... I find it very useful, um, I'm sure lots of other people do too. Um, and she's going to talk about a new project today, um, which is about feelings at work in the 1950s. Thank you, Emily, and thank you for coming. It's a nice day, so it's a shame to be inside. <laughs> um, so this paper comes out of a wider project um, on the emotional politics of Britain after 1945. Um, essentially, I'm interested in the work that emotion does. Um, and how emotion frames how people understand the world and their place within it, and how it frames and facilitates their engagement uh, with political culture. Um, so I'm interested, for example, in the way in which claims about authentic feeling are used to support knowledge claims, um, to cohere collective organisation and to facilitate resistance. Part of this project um, is about the place of emotion within reconstruction politics, um, how the post-45 world was built upon a foundation of feeling, and crucially, how the binary opposition between feeling and rationality, um, the long-established basis for gendered, class and racialized understandings of citizenship, was unravelled in this period. Um, but another major aspect of the project is to, or at least another time-consuming aspect of the project, um, is to explore the status of emotion within the world of paid employment. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, um, in the autumn of 1947, Mass Observation asked a married tax inspector, how do you feel about your job at present? His response reflected both a historically specific style of writing emotions and a stereotypically masculine attitude towards the subject. Quote, I feel that it is better not to feel about work, but simply to do the task immediately before me to the best of my ability. If I were to allow myself to think about my job, I fancy I should feel thoroughly disheartened. This conception of paid employment as an emotion-free space, whether as protection from personal demons or as an essential precondition for business efficiency, unravelled in the years that followed the Second World War. An emotional revolution that privileged the management of children's feelings and encouraged heightened emotional investment in marital relationships also impacted upon the everyday experience of doing a job. Nowhere was this trend more apparent than in attitudes towards and experiences of women employees. So in this paper I'm going to argue that the female worker, a significant figure within the post-war labour market, was consistently constructed as both inherently emotional and therefore ill-equipped for career advancement and as a talented emotional labourer, able to shoulder burdens that were not always remunerated. Post-war women were not, of course, the only people in history whose employment as well as domestic life has encompassed an emotional dimension. Lucy Dellap, Judy Giles, Alison Light, Karen Steedman and Selena Todd have all, for example, illuminated the emotional work of domestic service. Sorry to stop you, but there's no way to do it. Yeah, sorry. Just they can squeeze around here. Sorry, so it's not a There's no way to do it. 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 <laughs> so what's that mean? Yeah. 
what was distinctive <laughs> about the long 1950s was that emotion and women's management of other people's emotion, in particular, came to matter a great deal within public as well as private life. As Matthew Thompson has recently observed, the post-war settlement was founded upon powerful structures of feeling. In particular, the mother-child relationship was heralded as the bedrock upon which the health of the nation was to be built, a fetishisation of emotional security stemming directly from the experience of war. Relationships between spouses were also deemed crucial to the process of national reconstruction. The feelings of returning servicemen needed particularly careful management, and this was a task for which their wives were to be primarily responsible. However, rebuilding a nation necessitated looking beyond the family. The nation was just as valuable a tool for inculcating gendered citizenship in peacetime as it had been during the Second World War. The war effort had, of course, demanded carefully calibrated emotional mobilisation. Feelings of love, hatred and anger were deployed both in the service of patriotism and to give individual meaning to notions of national duty. And yet it was emotional restraint and resilience that were judged to have underpinned victory, even if fear had also quietly haunted civilian lives. The admonishment to keep smiling through, just like you always do, reinforced the importance of emotional fortitude in the face of adversity. The stoicism of women and the emotional support they provided for the men in their lives was crafted as a form of war work. This was a scaffolding upon which male achievement in battle might depend. The use of emotion in peacetime, then, built on an established repertoire of public feeling. Responding to the post-war la industrial labour shortage, as well as to expanding opportunities in the emergent welfare state, the British government deployed emotion in a number of female-focused recruitment campaigns. Appeals were made through newspapers, radio posters and the cinema with women aged between 35 and 50 a particular target. Quote, Many of you have your own household problems, but the country is up against it. Hospital orderlies were recruited with the request to be an angel, come and help. Potential teachers were told, look, the children need you, it's a worthwhile job. <coughs> and in the particularly pointed film, Women Must Work, a film I would encourage everybody who hasn't seen it to see, it's ace, it's on Pathé. Um, female viewers were informed that if you can manage to come back to work, you'll be helping the country, making new friends and putting more money in your bag. Emotion features in, the, in, in these campaigns in multiple ways. A distinctive emotional register was deployed to persuade female citizens into paid work. The emotional benefit of work to individual women was emphasised. And the work itself was often categorised as having a significant emotional, di emotional dimension, which women were particularly well equipped, apparently, to perform. Emotion was a valuable commodity. It was both central to the shaping of the female self in the public world and a driver of labour market mobility. Neither equal pay nor renewed financial support for day nurseries was part of the deal. Nor was the identity of worker to be more than an ancillary status for anyone other than those migrant women explicitly constructed as workers rather than wives and mothers. Nonetheless, a dramatic qualitative and quantitative shift in the nature of female labour market participation was one of the defining features of the second half of the British 20th century. By 1971, half of all married women of working age were in paid employment, a shift that has been characterised as the social revolution of our time. The expansion of married women's part-time employment, alongside improved education and employment opportunities for young single women, transformed understandings of women's capacity and reshaped domestic life even before the advent of the women's liberation movement. Throughout the 1950s, the implication of shifting work patterns for women, families and occupational hierarchies was much discussed. 
as the possibility that ordinary married women might be expected to perform two complementary roles gained ground. The health of children, husbands, nation, and more rarely, women themselves, was held to rest on the correct deployment of female labour outside the home. Too little, and the economy would falter. Too much, and society would suffer. Feelings loomed large in this discussion. Women's post-war employment was constructed and experienced through the lens of powerful emotions, such as guilt and anxiety about motherhood. Feelings about paid employment increasingly informed models of reflexive selfhood and identity. The emotional impact of work could frame the life experiences of other family members, as well as impacting upon personal well-being and health. Feelings at work became a matter for self-regulation, whilst the management of other people's feelings could be a significant, though often hidden, aspect of everyday life. So this paper sits at the intersection between the history of emotion and the history of women's employment. In his recent history of post-war working lives, Arthur McIver asserts that, quote, whether negative or positive, or the many hues of grey between, what is evident is that work was a deeply emotional experience. And yet while historians have developed new concepts for understanding emotions in the past, such as emotionology, emotional navigation, emotional regimes and emotional management, there's been little attempt to use emotion as a category of analysis within the history of work in the late modern epoch. In part, this reflects the dominance of cultural and intellectual approaches to the history of emotion. It also perhaps speaks to a tendency to focus on single emotions in isolation, something I've done, uh, rather than on feeling as a broad category or on multiple emotions simultaneously. And yet historians offer rich conceptual resources for the study of feelings at work. The notion of emotional communities, defined by Barbara Rosenwein as, quote, groups in which people adhere to the same norms of expression and value or devalue, the same or related emotions, has enormous if problematic potential for thinking about the dominance of different occupational cultures in different temporal contexts. Ben O'Gamel's suggestion that distinct spatial settings demand distinct emotional repertoires, he says, how specific emotions like grief, happiness or affection are generated, handled and expressed depends to a large extent on where they occur, can help us to think about employment-based emotional styles. Thinking specifically about women's work and emotion helps us to unpick contemporaneous understandings of public and private space and to trace the points where the apparently private bled into the public and where the ostensibly public bled into the private. Thinking more broadly about feelings at work allows us to explore the ways in which social relations underpin relations of production, to take the category of cultural history um, and to engage with it in social and economic terms. If historians of 20th century Britain have, have only um, incidentally explored feelings at work, Emotion-focused studies within the sociology of work abound. These are greatly indebted to the seminal work of Ali Russell Hotchchild, whose book, The Managed Heart, conceptualised the relationship between work and feeling in very precise ways. For Hotchchild, emotional labour was both embodied, the management of feeling to create a publicly observable facial and bodily display, and had exchange value. Emotional labour is sold for a wage. Writing in 1983, she located emotional labour in employment that involved contact with members of the public and, crucially, responsibility for their emotional state, which was also, in her reading, characterised by emotional controls imposed from above. Hoxchild developed the application of her term through work on airline, bless you, airline cabin crew and a smaller study of debt collectors consistently drawing a distinction between the performance of emotional labour and the emotional burdens that might be placed on a worker as part of the everyday experience of work. It was the former that was the focus of Hotchtail's research. 
in this paper, I'm interested in emotional labour and burden. Um, Centrally, I want to explore the interplay between them at a moment when the emotional and occupational um, culture of Britain was shifting significantly. And I think there's something uh, significant about the long 1950s as a context to explore this. This was a moment when the proper place of emotion and of subjectivity within public life was being actively assessed, when the boundary between public and private, as a number of historians have argued, seemed to be in flux, and when the psychologization of experience suggested new ways of storying, um, working, as well as intimate lives. A 1959 advert for the, Royal, for the Women's Royal Army Corps demonstrates the shift well. Her job is vital, and she knows it. She's an individual, free to express her personality. Yet she's part of a team doing important work. As we will see, she was also free to carry some of the gendered emotional burdens of domestic life into the world of paid employment. The kind of source base for this paper um, uses a range of um, experiential sources and, and, and cultural representations. Um, I'm going to be mapping contemporaneous feelings about the principle of female employment. I want to examine individual feelings about actually doing a job. I explore the emotional benefits and burdens of managing work in everyday life. And I want to investigate the forms of emotional labour performed by women in the round of played employment. I'm going to draw on the writings of some of the post-war experts that we're all familiar with. Um, and I'm also drawing on mass observations material, um, the material generated both within the middle of the 20th century, helpfully. Um, in 1947, they um, did a directive, uh, this open-ended questionnaire, um, which was on feelings about your job, which is helpful. Um, and I'm also going to be using retrospective um, accounts from the mass observation project, the post-1981 project. Um, and I think this material broadly, the mass observation material, is, is useful for this project in particular, um, although I would say that because it's near my office, um, because it sits <coughs> at the fold between public and private. Um, you know, it's, it's a form of expertise and a publicly expressed expertise rooted in everyday life. And within this material, the distinction between experience and representation is often blurred. Uh, those who wrote for mass observation in the mid-century were routinely asked um, to record their feelings on a wide range of subjects. If we take 1947 as an example, um, the volunteer panel of writers were asked how they felt about gambling, the atom bomb, charity, conscription, conscientious objectors, getting married, blindness and blind people, paper-bound books, religion rationing local papers and the royal wedding. And at the beginning of the year, they had been asked, how do you feel about 1947? Their feelings about changing work experiences were solicited on a number of occasions. And right back in January 1944, they'd been asked to consider the possibility of married women going out to work after the war and how they felt about it. So the respondents to the 1947 directive, which I'll be using quite a lot, uh, were well used to expressing their feelings on paper. Although some used feeling as a proxy for thought or belief, most writers were clear that their response to these questions offered what they believed to be an emotional perspective. As I said, I'm also going to be using the late 20th century mass observation project material as a way of getting into to people's feelings about work. And here, there are two directors in particular. One that was... Um, was released in 1983. Um, it was sponsored by the BBC Two, um, and that asked people to write their feelings about work in the past, present, and future. Um, and because of the date, actually, they talk about their, their parents' work, so you get quite a nice temporal range with that material. Um, and then, much later on, in 1997, uh, Mass Observation distributed a closely related directive questionnaire on doing a job. Um, which again asks people to think across time, across experience, 
um, and in that particular um, case also asked for their attitudes and opinions about particular <coughs> occupations. Um, and obviously the use of mass observation material is not unproblematic. The response is that I'm using a memory text, they're solicited from a self-selected group of people. Um, but I think that the way in which within the text prescription and practice intersect um, is, is, is useful to, m to my project anyway. Um, and um, I think that the material that is generated um, in all of those different mass observation sites um, is rich with everyday theorisation about the place and status of feelings at work. Okay. So, the growth of married women's paid work, in particular in this period, provoked varying degrees of anxiety, particularly, although not only, where children were involved. Criticisms of working mothers were not solely the province of post-war psychoanalysis, but the views of its key popularizers were fairly clear. Quote, the absolute need of infants and toddlers for the continuous care of their mothers will be borne in upon all who read this book, asserted John Bowlby in his much-read manual, Child Care and the Growth of Love. Competing attitudes towards women's societal role were sharply delineated in debates concerning her occupational capabilities and emotional status. Social scientists Alva Myrtle and Viola Klein, enthusiastic proponents of the two-role model, conceded that women do not yet feel at home in both worlds. In a study of wives who went to college published in 1957, Judith Hubbock described the dilemmas faced by relatively privileged women. The educated wife of today has to steer a careful course. She must avoid both the rocks of aggressive insistence on her status and also the mudflats of self-deprecation. She must be both feminine and masculine but not lean too far one way or the other. She must try to combine in herself some at least of the attitudes that were once believed to be found only in men with a liberal allowance of the qualities that marriage and motherhood engender. In a predominantly masculine world, she must restate feminine values and she must insist on the importance of human relationships. Unless her husband agrees with her wholeheartedly, these combinations and new orientations will be very difficult to achieve. With his love, his trust and his help, she will do great things. Within this reading, emotional self-management apparently underpinned fulfilling an effective female citizenship. A supportive and loving husband was important too, suggesting a carefully circumscribed emotional role for men within the post-war companionate marriage. And yet notwithstanding these apparent challenges, married women, with or without children and across social classes, increasingly did engage in paid labour and they drove an expansion of the part-time sector as they did so, assisted by the 1950 Factories Evening Employment Order, which relaxed restrictions on female shift work, facilitating an early evening, family duties friendly, twilight shift. As Doris Smith Wilson has demonstrated, these shifts did not necessarily mean that women's labour was accorded greater societal value, or that the overarching male breadwinner model was immediately destabilised. Yet individual female workers proved adept at moulding their personal models of good womanhood to suit everyday circumstance. Some actively rejected discourses of guilt. My girls are perfectly all right, my mother lives nearby and takes care of the children, one factory supervisor and mother of two girls told Ferdinand Zweig. I like my independence. Others emphasised the impact of women's employment upon the financial well-being of the family. As one mother of three put it, I don't care what people say, but I like this modern idea that all women should work. It's a change for them, and they don't have to slave away at home all day like I do. And it is better for the children as well. My Johnny often asks me to give him a few pennies for the pictures, like his friend from next door gets, but I can't give him anything. I have no money. Husband adopted their views too, often persuaded by economic arguments. My husband does not like it. He does not want me to go to work because men like to be our masters, don't they? A 19-year-old box factory worker with a baby confided. 
Zweig added. She thinks that she will manage to persuade him to let her go out because the money will come in useful for holidays, clothes, etc. When Viola Klein researched the experiences of working wives in conjunction with mass observation in 1957, she found that the husbands of working women were generally supportive, although not without qualification. Some had strong views. Quite definitely, I do approve, declared a 54-year-old clerk. Women who do not go out to work are narrow-minded, stodgy, uninteresting, miserable. Women who do are intelligent, can talk more interestingly and are more equal. No, a man, any man, who disagrees with his wife's work is jealous in case she meets someone else. If married women represented their paid employment as a method of enhancing family life, single women were encouraged to see work as an emotional substitute for husband and child. The slightly incredulous title of Leonora Ailes' self-help book, Unmarried But Happy, <laughs> reflected post-war attitudes towards singleness well. Ailes encouraged those without ties to pursue what she calls sublimation through work, to find an occupation through which they could channel their thwarted feminine aptitudes towards the public good, and this is a long-established idea. Those unable to pursue the reproductive er impulse might usefully immerse themselves in the civilised instinct to make the good life for the community and for coming generations. Looking after children, the sick and the elderly topped Ailes's list of preferred sublimating options. Positions of authority could be considered only with extreme caution, as the absence of spousal support might prove catastrophic, she says. Unlike the married woman or the married man, she has nobody at home to sympathise, to bolster her up. Fighting a battle in her work life, she may become embittered and tough. Far better to make herself the sort of person who is liked, whom people wish to cooperate with. Frails the emotional burdens of modern work necessitated emotional support at home from husbands as well as wives. Her sense of the emotional vulnerability of the single woman also reflected a creeping disdain for those who chose not to partner up in a period of near universal marriage. So thus far I've argued that emotion was heavily implicated in debates about women's paid employment in post-war Britain. The relationship between feeling and work was no less complicated within the home than it was outside of it however. When Mass Observation asked its panellists to write about their feelings about jobs in October 1947, the responses offered by women reflected divergent experience and definitional complexity. They also reflected confusion about where emotional investment should properly be directed. My job is housewife. Do I speak about that as though I go out to business? asked one woman, adding that after 35 years of doing and running and helping to run a home, I realise I don't like housework. <laughs> the challenges faced by those working in the home in a period when everyday items are in short supply permeate these answers. If you mean the job of housewife, well, I guess anyone is welcome to it at present time. It's just one long line-up for worry and work, observed a former, off former office worker. A 32-year-old mother admitted that I do get very fed up sometimes and long to go out to work. So when I did, I longed to give it up and to be a housewife. Housewifery was not necessarily endowed with more emotional content than work outside the home. A housewife can have no feelings on her job, wrote a 27-year-old. She just gets on with it as quickly as possible, anticipating the hour or two hours peace in an evening. Nonetheless, the impact of government campaigns to encourage active female citizenship was evident in the reported feelings of both self-defined housewives and paid employees about their jobs. A university research assistant admitted to loving her job, but she worried about its value. There are big joys and there are heartbreaks in research, but having once realised that that is part and parcel of the work, I am very happy in my work. I have splendid collaborators and friends and I am free with regard to ours. I like it so much it is worth the small salary that goes with it. 
Also, I am looking forward to getting a PhD, which means much to me. In certain moments of sanity, I feel useless and unproductive. But there is the other aspect that figures and facts on paper have their value and are useful in production, even if indirectly. Brackets, I am doing research on leather manufacture. Fear of letting the nation down framed the responses of many. Even a woman involved in cancer research worried about the perceived value of her contribution. I wish the government could dis devise some means in their production drive of giving people like me the feeling that we, meaning the non-producers, are in it together with the producers. Those working predominantly within the home are not immune to self-doubt. I feel very guilty about the lack of opportunity for social service of some <coughs> kind, more so as every available person is needed at full strength to pull us out of post-war difficulty, admitted a woman whose job consisted, quote, of merely in running a home in four acres, growing vegetables and rhubarb and geese, and keeping pace with a semi-invalid husband who is a major allergic. The retrospective accounts collected by mass observation in 1983 are refracted through the shifting emotional frameworks of subsequent years and reflect processes of life review and composure. In fact, their retrospective nature facilitates a particular kind of perspective on the emotional burdens and rewards of managing work in everyday life. Quote, being a divorcee with two young children and hardly ever receiving any money from my husband, I was forced to take almost any job that came along, called one woman. Her narrative reflects both the emotional and the practical dilemmas faced by working mothers and the inescapable way in which the private bled into the public. She wrote, I tried working full time, but sometimes one of the children fell ill and I had to leave. This happened several times. Or I would receive alarming phone calls from a worried elder child to say that little brother had not arrived home from school and what should she do? I was a nervous wreck by the time I reached home to find him safe and sound. Others wrote as the children of 1950s employed mothers. I earned more than I had ever done and for the first time since my father had died in 1934 I was able to keep my mom at home instead of her doing three jobs to keep food on the table wrote one daughter of her wonderful job in public transport. She continued, I was very proud of this achievement. As we've already seen, 1950s commentators warned against the emotional damage that working mothers might do to their children and by extension to society. The importance of full-time motherhood for the psychological development of the child formed the cornerstone of the advice often by, offered by Donald Winnicott on BBC Radio. And yet, in retrospective accounts, it is just as often the work of the father that is identified as the determinant of domestic emotional culture and a burden on other family members. His work was regularly interrupted by spells in bed with a duodenal ulcer, recalled one, woman, one daughter. He never spoke about this or theorised as to what was the cause of the illness, though the doctor talked a lot about bottling up emotion and being over-conscientious. This was repeated by mother and her story is all about the impact of this ill health on the family. Shift work had a distinct impact upon the rhythms of family life and could be a significant disruption to the emotional landscape of home as the woman recalled of her 1950s upbringing. She said, my parents work often affected the family life quite strongly. My father often worked shifts and quite often night work um, so life never really had a strict routine. When I was older, my mother also went out to work. She worked in the catering business, so quite often the hours were unsocial. In fact, my father's mid-years, he had a nervous breakdown, and this was attributed to the fact that he worked irregular shifts. I can't remember my parents really enjoying their work. My father was a manual worker, although he didn't see, really seem suited to it, being a gentle person. My father worked as a necessity, constantly worried about money. And I think there's a lot of stuff that can be done about shift work in this context. But here I really like that disjuncture between the emotional and physical culture of the father's workplace and his daughter's sense of, of his essential character as just not fitting. 
The emotional imprint of a parent's work could be experienced in other ways, notably in absence and in silence. The narrative of a woman born in 1941 began with the simple statement, my father worked. She then explained that he would not allow my mother to do so, and few of my school friends had mothers who worked unless they were teachers. My mother wanted to work because she was bored. I was an only child who had a large house and paid help with its cleaning and it was rather isolated, so it was natural that she should feel lonely. Mother was fond of saying, if I died, no one would know until they read it in the Liverpool Echo. My father brought work home with him most evenings. His job was secure, but I gathered highly stressful. He was often home later than expected and my mother worried so that as a child I couldn't settle until he was safely home. I was not allowed to bother him until he had eaten once he came in. I was also not allowed to make a noise when he was working at home in the evening, preparing reports for meetings, etc. Mother would sit quietly knitting or reading, but I wanted to play records once I had finished my homework. It was more relaxing to be at school friends' homes. For this writer and others, the shadow cast by a father's working practices at home ensured that the home was not an emotional haven. And yet her personal experience did not prevent her from looking to other people's families for what she believed would be missing was missing in her own. Her story also suggests that it was not just children who felt the impact of adult working lives. And his spouses were also affected by the nature of their partner's paid employment, his or her feelings about that employment, and cultural expectations concerning their role in supporting that work. Some husbands felt challenged by shifting financial dynamics. I earn £4.17 shillings and my husband gives me the same, one woman told Greg. What he could give me would not keep four of us in comparative com comfort. I like my independence, although there is another aspect to it. My husband feels that I become too independent, that I don't need him. Male resistance could take on more obstructive forms. Recalling her full-time shop job, one woman recalled that my husband was on shift work at the time and one Saturday refused to stay awake to look after the children. So I had to go down the road to the phone box to ring the shop and say I could not come in. On the Monday following I went into work and was told to go and they gave me a week's wages in lieu of notice. Judith Hubbock found that graduate wives of farmers, clergymen and doctors were more likely than most to be explicitly drawn into their husband's employment in a non-paid capacity. Of course, as far as being a companion to my husband, said one, and helping him in his work counts as my job, I think it's a splendid one, and enjoy it more than anything. Wives were expected to offer more than just practical support. Writing under the headline, How Few Wives Know What He Endures, Daily Mail columnist Iris, Iris Ashley lectured her readers on the psychic burdens carried by their husbands. If he is his own boss, all day long he has wondered about the fruits of his decisions. If he is not, then most days he will have had to deal tactfully with the man above him, reasonably with his equals, fairly with those below him, knowing all the time privately that somebody wants his job, or that if he could, the man below him would leap over him to the coveted position as his superior. It would help, she suggested, if more wives understood the strain under which their menfolk live, if they would let them unwind a bit at home and always give them time to recover at the end of the day. Some readers objected to her tone. Even psychologist, sorry, psychologist Carl Jung got in on the act in the press. Talking frankly to journalist Frederick Sands, he pointed to the emotional trauma faced by men at work. Women are unable to realise that in business their husbands are not the monarchs of all they survey. As often as not they are underdogs who have to put up with a great deal, a bullying boss for instance, and the best remedy for that is a woman's understanding. A male worker's emotional response to another emotional man thus became work for the wife at home. Indeed, as Mike Roper found in an oral history of post-war organisation men, the proper role for a businessman's wife was that of emotional support and occasional hostess. New products were sold on the grounds that they would assist wives in this mission. 
According to a 1959 advert, dandruff nearly prevented a Mrs. E Mrs. J.L. of Enfield from seeing her husband receive a presentation watch. However, the application of Loxen shampoo quickly solved the problem. And at the presentation, I felt so proud when I heard one of Ted's friends say what a smart wife he had. Such marvellous hair. An advert for gas implied that an improvised steak dinner for a husband's boss presented within the right emotional environment was a ticket to a posting in Rio. The intersection of personal appearance and domestic skill was clearly central to these representations, but so too was the ability to create emotional tone. Within this context, the female body acted as a proxy for emotion a representation of spousal feeling within a public sphere. Within the home as well as the, within the workplace, the capacity of women to regulate emotional culture, manage psychic problems, and crucially to control their own feelings, was so widely accepted that it rarely drew comment. The irony that highly sophisticated feelings work was being demanded of individuals simultaneously castigated as too emotional to succeed in the higher occupational echelons was not widely acknowledged. Contemporaneous notions of female suitability for particular occupations was rooted in the belief that women were possessed of innate emotional qualities. This belief could lead to a blurring of the identities of wife, mother and worker within the home and within the workplace. An Aspro Aspirin advert in Women's Illustrated featured a male worker sleeping at his desk. It's all nerves with you, observed a female colleague, before advising him to take a tablet. Aspro adverts for female customers assumed that they were capable of self-diagnosis, even as they acknowledged that women's duties today are never ending. The employment opportunities most often presented to women emphasised a feminine duty of care whether to children, the sick or vulnerable, or whether to their male co-workers and bosses. The mid-century decline in domestic service and rise of white-collar work has often been seen as a form of occupational modernisation. The office itself was a symbol of the modern through the foregrounding of new forms of technology. By 1971, clerical work accounted for 27% of all jobs done by women. However, the work that women employees actually performed in offices was, as Rosemary Pringle has shown, often another form of personal service. The emotional burdens more typically associated with home followed women into the workplace. In a Daily Mirror article entitled How to Pick a Perfect Secretary, women were advised to Anticipate his every wish, but do not fuss over him. Be poised and ruffled pleasant when the boss is in a bad mood. The personal secretary has to be a bit of a psychologist. She should do everything short of falling in love with him. In its What Shall I Be series, Woman and Home at least attempted to describe actual tasks, though the emotional labour involved is hardly any less striking. She knows how to compose good letters. She is completely dependable and possesses the qualities of discretion and absolute loyalty to her employer. She reminds him of appointments, shields him from unnecessary interruptions and receives callers. She makes all sorts of arrangements for him also. Books, restaurant tables, theatre tickets, hotel accommodation, train and plane reservations and settles details for the holding of board meetings and conferences. And one of her most valuable assets is the instinctive ability to anticipate her employer's needs. One mass observer rather caustically suggested that girls hoping to marry the boss traditionally chose to be secretaries whose work is like that of a wife, do most of the work and make him look as if he's doing it. Nonetheless, in the life writing of those who actually work as secretaries, the burden of emotional labour is clear, as is an underlying anger sublimated at the time but emerging over subsequent years. Quote, as secretary to the Captain Man Waring, described in the first part of this directive, I found myself in the main firing line while he preserved his lovable importance in a distant office, wrote a woman born in 1931. I had to lie and cover up for him, wrangle little goodies and freebies for him, boost his importance generally. I demand loyalty, was one of his catchphrases. 
it was my job to change his wife's books at the Times Library and actually choose something suitable for her to read, to rush out and buy chicory when it came in at the greengrocers. This was 1950. If she telephoned, I had to say he was in a conference. Secretarial work in this account included defending the boss's emotional capital, supporting his marriage as well as his career, and effectively training his actual wife, even choosing library books that she should read. It is perhaps little wonder that Marjorie Proops felt the need to ask her readers in 1957, does the boss make you mad girls? Whilst paid employment has often been presented as the antidote to domestic discontent, this evidence suggests that for some women at least, it simply involved the migration of private emotion work into the public realm, creating yet another type of double burden. The assumption that women possessed an innate capacity for unremunerated emotional labour marked their experiences in other occupational sectors too. Women police officers were, were perceived to be adept at performing emotional labour, for example. Indeed, it seemed difficult for women to avoid being categorised as emotional labourers. But this status could also block career advancement. As Ferdinand Zweig saw it, women were qualified to support but rarely to lead. Most women regard it as quite natural that they have to take a back seat and eat humble pie. They do not aspire to higher positions, to better jobs and foremost ranks. That is what is often referred to by managers who say they show little ambition or keenness to get on, or they regard themselves as helpmeets or assistants of men, not as competitors to their jobs. This is why they are so good as secretaries. A man might aspire to the position of the boss, but a woman hardly ever. She regards herself as a supplement to him, not as his competitor. End of quote. The better paid and higher status roles in the professions, industry and science were, by way of contrast, constructed as beyond the capacity of the normal woman because they demanded a rational and thereby inherently masculine approach. A study of women in industry conducted by Sear, Roberts and Brooke asserted that prejudice runs like a scarlet thread all through the pattern of this study prejudice against putting women into positions of power. Women are emotional and cannot deal with emergencies, they were informed by one male manager. They found managers who doubted the maturity of their women employers, employees and believed that they invested job relations with personal feelings. Zweig was told by one that they strike you as more childish. You can easily pull the wool over their eyes. If you approach them with a full string of figures, they are lost. Within the post-war workplace, then, the discursive separation of emotion from its implied opposite reason was mapped onto the workforce in explicitly gendered ways. While some occupations were seen as particularly suited to women's nature, this very suitability detracted from their status. Ultimately, the assumption that the working woman was innately more emotional than the working man acted to limit opportunities. Nonetheless, employers and co-workers increasingly came to demand emotion work from women employees as part of the ordinary working day, establishing a powerful and lasting model for women's behaviour in the workplace. To conclude then... The study of feelings at work raises questions about the gender status of particular tasks, the prevalence of unrecognised and unremunerated work, and the occupational resources from which modern subjectivities are constructed. It also raises wider questions about the relative value of the feelings of emotional actors in a modern democracy. Published in 1941, but based on experiences prior to the war, H. E. Dale's book, The Higher Civil Service of Great Britain, outlined what he termed the doctrine of feelings. He said, The importance of feelings varies in close correspondence with the importance of the person who feels. If the public interest requires that a junior clerk should be removed from his post, no regard need to be paid to his feelings. If it is the case of an assistant secretary, they must be carefully considered, within reason. If it is a permanent secretary, his feelings are a principal element in the situation and only imperative public interest can override their requirements. With the increased entry of married women into the workforce, this doctrine of feelings assumed an increasingly gendered dimension. 
In the long 1950s, those charged with the most emotional labour were often those whose own feelings were the least highly regarded and who were held to be most prone to emotional disturbance. The entry of married women into paid employment in larger numbers than recorded hitherto transformed the emotional culture of many workplaces. This was not because women were inherently more emotional than men, rather that the ability to juggle home and work and the public debate that surrounded this struggle actively contributed to the reshaping of the boundaries between home life and work life in modern Britain. Thinking about feelings at work offers new insights into occupational hierarchy, the value of different forms of labour, and perhaps also ways of conceptualising the nature of labour and the labour process itself. Work with an overtly emotional dimension was perceived as particularly well suited to the aptitudes of women. Women were therefore believed to be too emotional to perform high status work, notably that which involved the management of other workers. It was widely expected that women workers would perform unremunerated emotional labour and that wives would contribute both emotionally and practically to their husbands' paid employment. Analysis of the role of emotion in the mid-century also encourages us to think holistically about the relationship between people's working selves and their other selves, to consider how they move between different emotional communities and to identify the cultural tools and personal resources they drew upon to do so. More broadly, the study of employment and feeling allows us to see more vividly the extensive work that emotion actually did in the mid-20th century. Emotion played a powerful role within public as well as private lives, actively redrawing the historically contingent relationship between the two spheres. Moreover, concepts of public and private were mobilised to talk about the spatial, economic and gendered dimensions of emotion as a two-way process. Within the emotional debate of the long 1950s, private feeling underpinned public practice. This shift helped to establish cultures of workplace behaviour and gendered senses of the public self, which continue to resonate into the 21st century. The end. <laughs>